Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city, sweating the small stuff. Whew. It's a little hotter this week. I don't know what it is. Is, is it? I think a bit. Yeah? But it's starting to cool down. You're hotter this week. <laughs> oh, boy. Because your iPhone XS? Yeah, my, my beauty boy filter. It's making me look beautiful. <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Nick, let's talk about another really hot designer. Yeah. We're just jumping right into it. I'm just jumping right into it. <laughs> we we uh we're recording pretty close back to back. I think what we recorded Friday and today is a Tuesday. Five days. Yeah. We it's... didn't do anything this weekend. We just lounged around. No. No updates. No, well, well, not really. Well, well, I missed the update last week. Yeah, I mean, my wife went out on Saturday night, and I stayed in and made the micro details episodes of or clips for micro. the podcast yeah. the micro details and micro the, details for those of you who aren't aware are the youtube videos of the que- answering the questions yes so if you just want like straight up advice and helpful things quick tips quick tips check those out yeah and you don't want to listen to us babble on about whatever we're talking <laughs> about right now <laughs> i also put them into a playlist so if you want to just you know, put that baby on and just let it ride. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I can dig that. Oh, yeah. And you can see the development of our radio personalities or our podcast personalities. Oh, from the very original one. Oh, yeah. Um, But yeah, I did forget one update last week, which was I watched the Rams documentary. Mm. The Dieter Rams documentary by Gary Hurwitz. Huswitz? Hewitz? I'll look it up for you. All right. Tell me about it. He is the same guy that did the... Uh, Helvetica documentary and Objectified. Yes. And I would hope that everyone here listening to this has watched Objectified. If you haven't, Objectified is on Netflix. It is the quintessential industrial design movie. Oh, yeah. And his name is Gary Hustwit. Hustwit. Thank you, James. Mm-hmm. Um, and he took, I don't know, four, five, six years. I don't know the amount of years, but took a lot of years and several trips to Germany to document Dieter Rams, Rams' legacy of yeah. design. And? And it was good. It was good. It was a good documentary. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you expected me to say it was amazing, jaw-dropping, inspirational. Did Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the question that is on everyone's minds, because, because Dieter Rams' lore is so entrenched in the community already that... The, the question is, did this documentary bring to light any any new things right. about his legacy? Or I, w- I will just want to, I want to say one thing uh, for my mom that's listening. Dieter Rams. Oh, yes. Dieter Rams is like, Dieter Rams to industrial design is like the Beatles to music. Right? Would you equate that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Dieter Rams is the top. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't necessarily think of anybody, anybody else... Um, I mean, there's plenty of star designers and famous designers, but Dieter Rams is really the one that's uh, celebrated as you know the quintessential top refined industrial designer of of history. Yes, and 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 I would say you know one of the reasons that he is so um, I don't know. He's like, he's looked back. He's looked back on as so revolutionary is because you can still see the influence of his work in modern day design. Yeah, his work has been timeless. Apple has taken inspiration from it. Yeah. Um, but the Rams documentary was, it was great. I think it's interesting because it really shed light on Rams as a as a human in a way. It almost mm. humanized him a bit. Like it kind of hmm. took him down. It kind of like peered into his life. Like he's a very private person. There's not a lot of content about him. Right. Certainly not video content. I mean, there's books and things, but um, he, you know, it's just like to see his like personality and really his just like his, like there's one part in the documentary where he was working with. The the interesting thing that he was really stressing in the documentary too was that it wasn't only him. There's a lot of other designers that helped on some of these products. Right. Uh, for Braun, which was his main company he worked for. Like Dieter Lubs, I think, was another guy that worked on a lot of products with him. But 
he would he, he was like 85 years old it was his birthday party he was walking around this exhibition because he invited all of his friends and the new museum was up showing some of his work and he was hanging out with his old designer friend that he had at Braun. and him and his designer friend were like oh yo you remember when we were trying to make this radio and the engineers said that we couldn't do this so we just had to put a sticker on it remember that <laughs> and they were just like <laughs> laughing about like the mistakes they made on these you know uh, celebrated products that we see as almost you know un- untouchable in a way right that but, yeah it, yeah it just kind of like put a more realistic look on the man like it, it just like brought him down to earth which i think is why maybe it wasn't like a a dreamy documentary it was just like real it was like whoa like we're we're all we all can achieve this like we all yeah. can be as great as Dieter. yeah he's he's just a guy right exactly yeah i mean uh Obviously, a guy that had some sort of vision in mind. Yeah. Um, when he was, because Braun, Braun was already an established company before he got there, wasn't right. it? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think his role, although he was involved in, in the design, he was sort of overseeing all of the products at some point for sure he he rose the ranks but he came in pretty young to braun mm. he actually started out in architecture school yeah um and actually i believe at braun he was influenced by the designers before him right um or may, or some at some point he was influenced by other designers that kind of instilled this ethos of less is better mm. or whatever his good design is right less design is good design or something like that well and and didn't it all come stem out of the like the germanic approach to design yeah that was like started at the bauhaus and then yeah he went to the was it the ulm what what's yeah there were there i don't know exactly what school he went to but the the style is from the ulm school yeah i think he went to the ulm school i i i'm not sure if he went there or the designers that influenced him went mm. there it was in the movie. I, I, it was a great documentary. It definitely was fairly informative, and I really enjoyed it. I'll say that. Definitely go watch it. Yeah, he went um, to the old school. Okay. And, yeah, it was good. Yeah, because I, I feel like, you know, because the, the whole less is more um, ethos and aesthetic really comes from designers who were were intimate with the industry, right? So yeah. like the idea of really celebrating the um, industrial process, you know, and just sort of adding no necessarily like decorative elements to anything. And right. Because if you're adding decorative elements to things, especially back in those days with the machinery that they had, that would have been extremely costly. Mm-hmm. Um, so they celebrated sort of like raw, more like raw materials. Like or, economical design. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, that's cool. I, I'm, I was a backer of the, of the Kickstarter. Um, so I'm excited cause I get, I think I get a download of the movie when it's finally officially released. Oh, so I can come over to your house and we can watch it again. <laughs> again? Yeah. Oh, and you like, no spoilers, Nick. Uh, another cool. I've already, I've already spoiled it for everyone listening. <laughs> another cool factoid about the movie is that Brian Eno did the soundtrack. And I don't know if you know who Brian. I don't. I don't know who he is, but I know a lot of people were freaking out, freaking out about it. Yeah, who he's he? he's a big time uh, producer. Okay. I mean, he, um, Did he does he produce for Kanye? Or? <laughs> I don't know if he's ever collaborated with Kanye. That's actually a good question. But he um, he started out in a band called Roxy Music. Uh, I, this is from my recollection. He started out in a band Roxy Music, but then he became more of a producer. And he like he did a lot of production work for David Bowie back in the day, um, but he's done. He kind of is known as the sort of uh, he invented ambient music. He's like he is sort of like credited as the founder of ambient music. Interesting. Okay. Um, so he has like albums. Like there's an album that is uh, sort of a. It's a a number of piano pieces that he did for an airport in, I think it's in Denver. And it's like, it's purely for background music. And I think he also did the startup music for Windows 95. (laughs) Like he, he like wrote that 
score you okay know, for for like the startup i get it okay so, that's that's pretty awesome yeah so he's really he's he's awesome but yeah. I, I do want to touch on another thing about the Rams documentary, which was interesting. And I wish we would have touched on it before uh, last week because last week we did our Instagram episode. But right. Dieter Rams has gotten to this point now as technology has come out. he He's really struggling with, with the whole, you know, glue to our phone addiction thing. And right. he himself doesn't even own a cell phone. I think he might have a landline or something. Yeah, he's actually notoriously hard to get a hold of, is what uh, the the director was saying, and I I think it's a very valuable point. Like, what what is design nowadays when we're designing apps and things, and how you know if the goal of a designer is to design the best experience, and you are designing the best experience for an app, does that mean actually designing a a restrictive experience so you don't spend all day in the app? Mm. I've thought about this a lot, especially after watching this this documentary. I was like, if the goal of a designer is to, you know, create this awesome experience where you keep wanting to do it over and over again, like Instagram, at what point does it become too much of a good thing? Mm. Yeah, I, you know, what if uh, <laughs> here here's an idea? Yeah, here's an idea. Instead of Instagram being available every day of your life what if it was only available the first day of every month and you posted you posted what you did in that last month like you you took pictures you documented everything but you post what you did and then it's just like one day it's like almost like the purge it's almost like that movie the purge but it's like instead of you know Killing killing people it's like the first day of every month everybody posts and you check out everybody's post, and, and then we, it blacks out and for everyone, the rest of the month. Everyone has to take that day off from work because <laughs> all they're doing is scrolling through a month okay, of photos. Okay, first, first Saturday of every month. First Saturday. First Saturday. There goes my Saturday. First Saturday. Of every month. Um, um, yeah. Well, I definitely recommend it. I know it'll come out eventually. I don't know the details. Sorry, guys. I'm sure that you can Google you it. You don't know the minor details? No, because there's going to be people being like, oh, where can I watch it, Nick? I'm like I don't I don't know I just went to the movie theater and watched it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So basically, what Nick is saying is, let me Google that for you. Um, so yeah, you you guys can figure it out. You guys are smart. Yeah. You're designers. <laughs> we oh, believe man. in the intelligence of our audience. Um, but uh, you know, do you think Dieter Rams would ever do freelance work? Do you think he still does he do does he still design? No, he's done designing. He's done. No, like because the director got up there on stage and answered a lot of questions because it was the opening show. What do Premier? you call it? Premiere? Premiere. Yes. <laughs> Movie? Is that a thing? Okay. Um, he got up on stage and was like, "Yeah, Dieter Rams really just kind of just contemplates now. He goes and he sits in his office and thinks about his legacy and figuring out how to just spread." his new ethos of design, which kind of involves the whole, how do we restrain ourselves from technology? And I don't know, how do you better, better the world with design? Right. I think he, 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 there's a certain point in his mind that flipped where he went from like, Oh, I'm designing all these products to, Oh wait, are these products actually bad for humanity? Mm. Do you think given that you are such a VR boy, uh, that, (laughs) <laughs> At some point, the technology, like the apps and the technology are going to become so integrated into our lives that it's not even going to be like opening up an app. It's just going to be, it's just going to be there. Like, like how our piece of furniture is here, Instagram will always be there. Because yeah, if you're in VR, I mean, you could have just like the Instagram wall. You right. Know, you're, you're in your house, like, you know, cooking food or whatever. And then you look over on the wall and there's Instagram. Right. That's kind of cool. Yeah, you just have picture frames. You have like a bunch of picture frames on your wall, and they just populate with. That's with, a uh, good idea, James. With Instagram, imagery. I like that. I like that. Um, but um, but yeah, I don't I don't know if Dieter Rams would freelance or not. But J- James was trying to segue into our topic. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, our segue. Oh, uh, thanks a lot. We you need, just reveal it. Where <laughs> goes the magic? We need some help on our segue. <laughs> um, well, you know we've been getting a lot of questions about freelance obviously it's a it's a definitely a big topic and something that we wanted time to really think about and frame it in the right way 
um, before we just dove straight into it. It's it can be a, a tough topic to cover. Um, so we want to we want to try to give it a shot today and talk about how we started freelancing, how we rate, uh, price ourselves, and I don't know our opinions, pros and cons. Yeah. You know, since Nick, I feel like you of of the two of us, you have been eager to cover this topic. So I am. Eager. I feel like it would be better for you to start it off. Sure, sure. I so yeah, I I've been wanting to talk about this for a while now, because um, I think it's important and a lot of people are interested in it. Um, I started freelancing a year ago, right? I mean, I moved to New York. I had a full time gig. Decided to quit my job. Mm-hmm. Called my dad and be like, "Hey, jo- hey, dad." I, uh, I quit my job. I'm moving to New York. I don't have a place to stay or a job yet, but I'll figure it out. And then hung up the phone really quickly so I didn't hear him yell at me. <laughs> no, did, no, did I'm, he I'm yell just, at you? No, I'm joking. My dad was very supportive of me, so I, my, my, I'm super grateful that my parents were supportive. Um, but, yeah, I, I got here, and I actually was trying to find a full-time gig when I first got here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, was looking around and applying places and stuff and in the meantime obviously was picking up small things here or there as i could right and i started to realize like you know becoming good friends with you and having you connect me with some of your people um and starting to do some of these freelance jobs that are in the city kind of like pseudo in-house jobs right you're right. you're going into a place to do freelance um that it was it was a viable way to to work, a viable way to make a make a living. Absolutely. And you know, I think a lot of times people think of freelance as someone who kind of sits in their room and you know draws and works with clients over email, and you know, you're not making money. That that I think that's like the I don't know the stigma that I, I've seen is that freelance is kind of like the the secondary. It's like, oh crap, I can't find a full time job, so I'll just freelance. Hmm. But yeah. I, I think I think if you do it right, it's actually a really nice way because you can control your schedule. Yes. Um so yeah. Started out wanted to do full time and then kind of by accident I decided that freelancing was more appealing. Now why did you want to do full time? Um, I think there was pressure. Yeah. I, I would say yeah, I think when you quit your full-time job at a pet company and move across the country and you kind of want to like show your parents that like, Oh yeah, I I can get a full-time job in New York too. It's no big deal. Don't worry about me. You know, like, um, I think there's a little bit of pressure there. You know, I I think that the pressure is different for everyone. I know a lot, a lot of people, their parents could have been super upset and really pressured them to do different things or, you know, maybe shun them or something i don't know i know not everyone's family life is 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 everyone has a different story but yeah i i uh i don't know i think full time's easy too yeah freelance is difficult i am um, well i and i don't mean to like belittle the full time worker because i i think there's a lot of benefits to full time and, oh, for and sure. there's a lot of drawbacks to freelance like you know and vice versa like taxes yeah help (laughs) (laughs) they're coming they're coming for me april 15th i'm going to jail (laughs) but it's funny the thing that you say about your dad yelling at you i mean there were there were things that my parents had given me advice about in terms of employment that although i think you know and and i I don't want to i don't want to make this sound like i'm I'm saying that my parents gave me bad advice. Right. But well they never they never want to give you bad advice. They're they love you. you know? right. They're trying to give you the best advice they can. But I think like the economy that we're in and, and like the like the job market that we're in is so different from the job market that they grew up in. Right. Because, you know, I remember them telling me in my first job kind of like, you know, stick it you, out for you 5 stick years. It out. Yeah. yeah, you should stick it out. And I kept seeing examples of friends of mine going against that advice and 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 landing fine. You know that that they would figure things out the, otherwise. The job market has changed definitely. Um, I also think like it's it like stick it out and 
you know, work at some place for three or four years is still like a, a valuable thing. Like I think, I mean, I worked at the pet company for like two and a half years. How long did you work at your kitchenware company? Three years. And there's a ton that you can learn about taking an idea all the way through the production phase, like sourcing yeah. and thing, which you sourcing and, and things like that, which you don't necessarily get in the freelance no. world. No, I'm very grateful for the experience actually that I had at the full time gig. You mm-hmm. know, there were there were certainly ups and downs and to my parents' credit, there was a point where I was in a in a down phase and they were like well, maybe it's time to start looking for something else. You mm-hmm. know, it wasn't like they were, they kept telling me like, stick it out, stick it out, you know. But um, there are there are certainly things that were incredibly valuable about the experience that I got at my full-time gig, as well as the connections that I made there, which have impacted my freelance career entirely. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, like... I think that a full-time gig can be incredibly valuable for for somebody just out of school. Because, you know, it's like we talk about school and there's like a certain madness and chaotic nature to school. Right. And it's, and it's nice to have a little bit of a breather like once you graduate and, and you're in a full-time gig to just be able to like relax for a second like and, 5 p.m and reflect yeah i i 100 percent agree and i definitely think this is maybe something that we both agree on is that graduating from college i think you should get a full-time gig i don't think mm. you should grab because there are a lot of questions that come in and i get them frequently too just on dm where it's like hey i'm graduating you know i, I was thinking about going full-time freelance work and it's it's freelance is hard. It's not easy to do, to, you know, manage clients or even get clients in the first place. Right. Um, some people can do it. I, I don't want to say that you can't do it, but you know, like you said, getting a full-time job after school is kind of like second school. It's like you get to go to a school that'll pay you. Yeah. And it's going to teach you all these things that you never learn at school. You didn't learn how to injection mold something. I mean, maybe you learned it, Maybe you learned how to injection mold at school, <laughs> but let me tell you, you definitely did not. <laughs> um, and you need it, it. It's just such valuable. To ha- it's so valuable to have that knowledge. And then also, like you were saying, making those connections. Um, I feel like maybe my connections weren't as valuable going from Texas to New York just because of the distance. I still keep in contact with, with uh, a lot of my contacts in Texas, but right, it's not like I'm getting a lot of freelance jobs through that past job yeah but through your instagram hustle you made connections to new york yeah i mean that's what established the connection between you and i yeah so so that's another way that i feel like is has been super beneficial to my freelance career is like building up this large community not only I'll, i'll rewind a bit i think i feel like I, I've been successful in sustaining a freelance freelance career because of the work I've previously done. If you graduate with school and you don't have the the polished work where people are emailing you online and saying, hey, I want to work with you. Right. Then I feel like, like I've never sought out a client. Mm. Clients have always come to me and said, hey, I have this project. Can can you give me a quote for it? Can Can we work together? And they locate you through your Instagram? It used to be Behance or my website. Okay. Um, now it's a lot more skewed to Instagram just because I feel like a lot more people on it, using it. and Yeah. See, I've, I've rarely had that experience. And I feel like that's, that's a case where I'm not very good at demonstrating my skills. Right. But you have the other way. You have the other thing, which is like charm. <laughs> <laughs> Connections. Well, yeah, I mean, essentially, that's how I had to build up my freelance network was was just um, mouth to mouth reputation. Uh, you know, uh, I it looks like I'm going to be starting a gig soon that was purely through somebody that I had freelanced with. You know, they got me in touch with a friend of theirs who needed an industrial designer. You know, it's once you get. If you're in a city like New York and you get into the community of designers within that, you know, there's going there are going to be times where, you know, that 
you're going to get the text out of the blue that's like, hey, are you available right now? Yeah, yeah. Um, which has happened to me uh, like a number of times. I kind of feel like that's how you've worked for the past however many years. I mean, it, seem, it seems like you just keep getting new and new projects and you've never, I mean, you were telling me like after you let your, after you left your kitchen job, you haven't had a really a break from full-time gigs, you know, yeah. like you've been going into all these other uh, places and doing consulting work and it, you haven't had a break, right? Is that true? I, I just had a little bit of a break, which I thought was going to be a longer break until recently. Oh, right. Cause I stole your but. job. <laughs> but, but, um, but it didn't it didn't last as long as I thought it was going to. Yeah, I think, I mean, you've established yourself, so I don't think you would ever take. I don't think you would ever be during a break that you would not want. Like, if you want a break, James, I feel like you have to intentionally take it. Right, and uh, and I was actually just kind of settling into the break and working on working on those personal projects. James, they sucked you back in, man. <laughs> But it, that that is a that that is a part of of this whole freelance thing is is like you know at some point there there's always this fear of of the uh, the market drying up or the opportunities drying up and it and you feel you feel this need to pounce on every opportunity that comes your way and. There's not necessarily a good way of determining whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. I um, I, I mean, you would have to be really knowledgeable of your finances, you know, and, and just like really thoughtful about, you know, the the future to be able to determine like whether like do I want to take this gig or don't I want to take this gig? I struggle with that a lot because I do want to take on every single gig that's offered to me. Right. Um, but I also think that not everything is – I'm not the best designer for everything. You know, if someone comes to me and they're like, I want to design, you know, a fashion dress for my – my, my <laughs> you know, whatever it is, my dog or something, I'm like <laughs> – you know, yes, I worked in the pet industry, but I don't think I'm the best person. You're you don't think you're good at dog drapery? No. I could see you with like a little <laughs> little canvas dog model just draping fabric over it. I don't know. I th- I see that in your future. I've gotten close to that, but <laughs> <laughs> to the dra- oh, yeah, we're not yeah. Um yeah, I, I I don't know. It's I I agree there is this like gut feeling that's always trying to work because you don't have a full-time job yeah and it does it does put a strain on you i i feel like in the past year it's been it's been a hustle for sure it's definitely i've worked a lot harder this year than i did in the past two years in texas Mm. um and has that been a good change do you think or is it a mixed bag no i think there's pros and cons i kind of i kind of equate it to um you know i came up here to new york because i wanted to to explore new opportunities to really push myself and new york was like all right here you go here's your new opportunities and i'm like these are amazing i i embrace these opportunities but it's kind of like new york was just like almost like dumping them on me like <laughs> suffocating me in a way and yeah it it you know you can kind of get run, run up into the rat race a little bit right with new york i think i think it's totally understandable and and i would almost encourage taking on too much when you first start freelancing okay because i think that that's that is the way because like you don't want to i i think if they're if the opportunities are coming in take them and and then feel out how to manage them or if you can manage them like of course if you take on all of these projects like even if it takes some all-nighters or whatever you can finish them but i think like I, I don't know, this might be terrible advice, but but it it's almost like you can then start to figure out like what you can take on and and what you're capable of, and you know there's always the option of of outsourcing. Like you could you know if you're if you feel like you're taking on too much, you could tap into another freelancer. That's another thing is like as a freelancer, you should kind of be intimate with the freelance network around you of other freelancers right 
you know, because, because you know, if, cause if I can't do a job, then I can be like, hey, James, you want to do a job? Or I can yeah. just call up another another friend and be like, hey, I have this other, I have this client that needs this work done. I can't take it on right now. Right. Or you can even say like, okay, I want to manage this this job, but like, say you know somebody that's more junior to you as a freelancer, you can say, hey, like, want to help me out? Yeah, want to help me out? Like, let's work on this together. Yeah. And then you just you just put that into the pricing, mm-hmm. you know, of your freelance work. That's totally viable as well. Um, I think. Well, we had a question come in and from Jimmy Dot Design. I think this might be a good a good segue to um, kind of talk about like the nitty gritty and how we kind of work with our clients, price them out, do quotes and things like that because. It's a common question, like, how do you price yourself? Jimmy was saying, I've been on and off for the freelance life for a little bit, and I'm not sure what I should charge and slash could charge, and how should I go about dealing with this stuff? And what do you guys think about that? Mm. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, we James and I have discussed this a lot. Money is definitely a, a – could be a taboo subject, and, you know, it it's something that I – I feel open about. Um, not everyone does, so I won't make anyone say any numbers. But I, I think there is a system that we can kind of create to, I don't know, help you guys figure out what what you should charge for client work. Right. And I know you've had you've given me some advice, especially when I first moved here. Yeah, and and I and I handed down advice mm-hmm. that I got from. Um, uh, actually, a designer that I worked with at Quirky, his name is Adam Pascal, um, and I, I just asked him, like, how do you rate yourself? How how do you put a price on your work? Um, and you know, there's there's sort of like two different ways that you can that you can quote. You can quote for hourly, or you can quote for the project. Right. And a lot of times, you know. I, I leave it up to the client okay. to decide that. Yeah, a lot because just in my experience, the client will either ask for a full project quote or they will say, "What's your hourly rate?" Right. Um, but but yeah, he he even said in his original message, like clients aren't always into that because it incentivizes you to go slower. Yeah, but, hourly is like, oh, well, I could do this project. And if I worked really slow, maybe I could drag it out for yeah. three months. <laughs> but then again, like if you're working outside, if you, if say you're picking up freelance outside of your day to day job, then I would price myself higher and work like either work in an hourly or or quote high because like especially if it's like a rush job right. or something like that, that's something that you have to consider. Like is is this project is this project a rush or, or is it, do you have some time built into it? Mm -hmm. Um, but he got into the nitty gritty and said, um, you know, figure out what you would want from a salary job and then add the cost of insurance. Um, and then like the cost of taxes. Right. So like, cause there's no, there's no benefits when you're freelancing. So you have to include that. We, I mean, we have to, I mean, I have to buy my insurance. I don't know about you, James, but right. I uh, I actually am on my wife's health insurance. Nice, nice. Get married, freelance. <laughs> there, there you go. There's your tip. Get married. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think you should cushion in those kind of costs into your rate. Right. Uh, consider that you know at the end of the year, like a good chunk of that is going to go out to taxes, especially if you're living in New York City. Yeah. Um, and then. He said, assume you're working 70, 70% of your free time. So, uh, you know, you can afford to not be working 30%. So, like, you know, because, basically price it out because that way. 30% of the time you're trying to find clients or maybe you're doing, like, administrative tasks. Like, like if, you're, if you have to take a day off to, I don't know, because you're sick or maybe because you have to travel. I mean, you don't get vacation time when you're yeah. a freelancer, you know? And then he added he added this note to it, which I think is really valuable, which is you should assume that any customer will try to haggle you down. You know, th- it's a negotiation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you should always start high, like always start higher than than you think. Yeah. And especially if you, 
I've been in situations where I don't necessarily want the job. Like I don't need the job. I don't want the job. So I will, I will go much higher than I normally You'll say would. an absurd, absurd number. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then negotiate down from that because like, if I don't get this job, I'm totally fine. Right. You know? And, uh, and I mean, that is honestly, actually that's, that's kind of a good way to approach freelance in general. I agree. Mm hmm. Because I have, I've threatened to like walk away from a project like a week before it started because I thought the rate was way too low and, and they came back and like met me where I was, where I was asking for. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think there is a good, a lot of good rule of thumb for your friends, your friends rule. Um, for me, I, I've taken that rule and I've kind of embodied it, but I have also like add on a bit of my, my thoughts let me hear what you baked into that what i my my nick baker <laughs> baked in prices easy um, baker oven so you've introduced me to the hourly rate thing i've always priced my my design work as project based mm. um and i i try to do that even if someone asks for my hourly rate but when you go into work in the city like inside a, a company like you go in and you sit in there at their desks and work with them, I think hourly is fine. Um, but if you're, you know, consulting with a, a client and they, you know, want you to design X product because they're, you know, they have a Kickstarter for the new bottle opener. <laughs> you know, they want you to design the new bottle opener. That's when you base project um, for a couple reasons. I think if you price it right, you're giving them a lot more value. Um, and you're getting paid well. You never want to price a project rate way too low. That you know, let's say you priced a project for three thousand dollars, and then you worked for uh, I don't know six hundred hours. What is that? Fifty dollars an hour? <laughs> six hundred hours is five dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, you never want to. You never want to run out of. You always want to make sure your project rate is the correct rate and this is how i figure that out so what you do you have a new client they want you to design a bottle opener so you sit down and you're like okay how long will it take me to design a bottle opener well let's see maybe eight hours of sketching um eight hours of cad um you know five hours of cmf color finish you know color material finish and then let's say you know you have three hours of meetings with the client right so Let's say that rounds out to like 30 hours, right? Now, that's what you wrote down, but here's the trick. You double it because it always takes you twice as long to do <laughs> all those things. So you get 60 hours, right? It takes you 60 hours to design this ball opener. And and you take those 60 hours and you times it by your suggested hourly rate. And you can really, the hourly rate thing, how you figure that out, I mean, Coraflot has a great guide onto how freelancers price themselves and the salaries of, of things. But there's a lot of factors that go into your hourly rate and how you price yourself. Not only is it what city you live in, um, you know, if you live in a, a expensive city like San Francisco or New York, you have to price yourself higher. Right. Um, but also think about supply and demand. Do you need this project? Like you were saying, James, like are you working full-time at a company and you're just – doing this project in your free time well your free time should cost money i mean this is your free time yeah you don't need this money this is like you know if, if a client wants to work with you price it high um so yeah you times that by your hourly rate and then you get your your project quote um i i'll, I'll divulge my hourly rate uh i am in anywhere from like 80 to like 120 mm -hmm. but please be reminded that that is in New York City, and I'm also, it's a supply and demand game, right? Yeah. If if one client says, no, this is too high, that's okay. There's plenty of other clients. Right. Right. You just, you don't necessarily, the, it's a delicate dance because you also don't want to um, leave a bad taste in their mouth of like, of like, oh, well, we can't, we're not going to like hire that. It's... You, it's tough. You know, it's, you know, you never want to come off as like someone who like is too good for a project like that. Right. Um, but also you have to understand like, 
your time is valuable. You know, you don't want to just give away your. I mean, this is your life. Yeah, that's how. That's this is how life works. You <laughs> trade your time for money, and absolutely, how much is your time worth? And I think, um, you know, the other thing is, uh, oh gosh. I think the other thing is, is if you are very honest with your client about like how like your thought process behind how you're pricing, mm-hmm. like you know I I've specified to clients like since this is a rush job and and all of the, and I'm going to be working hours you know outside hours or even weekend hours or whatever right. this is why I priced it here right and I, I think that. I think that's a really good way of managing that relationship is just being transparent and honest about like why why you're pricing something a certain way because it might come across as like f- much more expensive than they're than they're used to but I think they're also very aware of like you know somebody's been given a task of like you need to you need to finish this by this time and and like even if you need to hire a freelancer like we have this budget for this like you need to you need to be honest about like yeah this is going to take time away from like my life right and 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 so and and times that i normally would not be working and just be honest and transparent about it i think there is there's like i hate to like be like the oh honesty is the best policy type person but i do think that like as much as you can have an honest relationship with your client without divulging too much, but like enough to be enough to be like, you know, transparent enough to have established a good relationship with them and, I, I and agree. an honest relationship with them, then like there's there's also respect that is built between you and the client. And uh, yeah, that's that's going to pay dividends in the long run. I, I definitely agree. You know, clients, great ones are hard to come by. Like clients are like managing clients, especially when you do like remote work and things like that. It's a little easier when you can get to go into a company and kind of join the, the company as a whole. But when you're just yourself managing a client that's, you know, trying to do this Kickstarter ball opener. Sometimes it's a little tough, you know, maybe the client doesn't quite understand design or doesn't understand the process. What I like to do is I like to lay out kind of the milestones and I also pr- like break down the prices. So if my, you know, if I quoted this bottle opener, it's going to cost me $5,000 to design. I'll divvy up the prices into, you know, four or five sections of like, all right, you know, give me $1,000 to start the project. I'll do some concept sketches. We'll refine those concept sketches by this date. And then, you know, three days later, here is your deadline to give me feedback. Mm. And then when you give me feedback, I'll do another round of concept sketches. That'll take me another week. And then feedback some more. And then you'll pay me another thousand. And then you kind of like, you kind of do step by step. You ask for money up front. Yeah. Yeah. I When I do my remote clients, like project-based clients, I'll... I'll break it down in kind of step by step format because not only does it give them again that honest look at the process and the timeline, but it also gives me a goal to to work towards. Like, oh, I said, you know, back when we started this project in that email or you know document, it said that I was supposed to do this concept sketch by, you know, October twentieth. Right. And by the way, I gotta get on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I uh. I actually would love to see that breakdown. You want to see that? Because I'm not used to to uh, quoting things by project. Right. I'm used to hourly rates. And, like, there's not really a good resource to look at for how to break down, like, a, an entire project quote. Right. I kind of generally, I break it down into two phases. You have concept phase and CAD phase. Mm-hmm. You know, concept phase is all about sketching, come on, coming up with the idea. CAD phase is all about taking the idea that you and your client decided on and executing on it, you know, printing it out, testing it if you need to, refining the the measurements, the weight, whatever it is. Um, those are my two main phases. And then eventually I turn over the design to the client. And that you got to have that key point where it's like, I am designing this product 
And the final deliverable is a 3D file and, you know, a PDF of how it's supposed to look. Right. right. You never want to say, like, oh, yeah, he, yeah, I'll design the product. Let me know if you need anything. Like, <laughs> because, because they're going to get, especially if it's your Kickstarter bottle opener person, you know, your Joe Schmo who wants to just make a bottle opener, they're going to get to the final design and you're going to you're gonna help them design the product, but they don't know how to make the thing. Right. Like, what, what are they going to do next? Are they going to go to a manufacturer? Like, some people don't understand the, the work that goes into product development. Right, right. Especially right after you design the product. I mean, we, we talked about this on a podcast, right? Mm-hmm. There's a whole other next step to design of you finalize the design, but wait, how do you make the thing? Yeah. And that was something that... Um Dave Joseph was talking about when when we interviewed him on major details after the pod. Yeah, we we do the live. If you guys don't know about the live stream, it's kind of hard to catch. It's elusive. Major <laughs> details. Uh, we've never shouted out our Instagram. There is an Instagram called Minor Details Pod. Have we shouted that out? I don't know if we have. I mean, we've certainly shouted it out on our Instagrams, but right. we haven't shouted it out on the podcast. Well, you know we have started to bring in guests on the live stream and we talked to Dave joseph who is Dave joseph <laughs> dave joseph <laughs> sorry <laughs> is doing some some kind of kickstarter work for this company he founded called ovi it's like a tupperware smart, oh it's a funded kickstarter smart he's, tupperware yeah so it's already finished oh yeah so he he's working through the sourcing phase now and you know his point which was which was one that is very valid and one that I think sometimes as freelancers you won't get as much involved in is the production phase. And because yeah. as a freelancer, sometimes you just kind of turn over the design intent. Yeah. And that's that's the last time. You kind of like wave you kind of hug your kid goodbye as it goes to college. And then it it if it ever comes back it'll look completely different. <laughs> it has like a beard. Right. And if it ever comes back. Yeah. Um, like, so that's the thing is like great products. That's, this is kind of the double edged sword of freelance is like you, you get to work on a lot of diverse products and, and, and I almost feel like, you know, it's something that probably design firms often experience because I can see freelance evolving. It's like, it's stage one Pokemon uh, (laughs) and stage two is, is consultancy. Yeah, you know, yeah. because eventually, if if you're taking on too What's many stage three, oh, I don't know, smart design, Dieter Rams. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's it's a consultancy that then embeds themselves into a larger company. Oh, you know, because mm. I I know that smart it's design a... has a relationship with OXO and like Fuse Project had you know they they were like oh they made their own. Yeah. Fuse Project launched a few things. I mean, you have but they're, August, but they're have owned by Canary. like a, a Chinese communications company. Oh yeah, I think they recently sold. Are they? That was a recent thing. I have to look back at that article. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Yves Pahar was talking about it. But but anyway, um, you know, uh, the quality is really during that. Like when great products are solidified is during that production phase, and you have to have like. A really great quality team. Did you just finish the wine? Sorry, James. Here, I unbelievable. No, oh, we're not sharing wine. I cannot believe this. I'm this sorry. whole podcast, I've had such a good time talking about freelance, and then <laughs> Nick Baker just drains the well. I just apologize. completely. I, I, I don't know what was what I was thinking. Oh my gosh! But anyway, the production phase is when great products are made, and I. I 100% agree with that and that's one thing I do miss about in-house is that I don't know I don't I don't feel like it can have a lot of control anymore and that's why you start things like almost object right. or you know I like I'm you side projects yeah and and you you take your own ideas all the way through which is kind of like the one of the pros I think of freelance is that you can do these side projects or pursue your own kind of endeavors or passions at whim right do you have it like what's your one pro to industrial design to kind of like wrap up this to freelance yeah industrial design consult freelance yeah whatever sorry <laughs> this is, is this wine is pretty good it's good it's good wine um but uh do you have a pro my pro is that i think we kind of talked about this 
when you stole my job was that like um it's it's nice because when you're when when you're finished with a project or when you're no longer needed you don't have to stick around like you you don't have to stick around and wait for your next assignment right. you're which, not twiddling your thumbs yeah which which could come at any time and and you know i'm able to walk away from things when I feel like my job is done and like I can move on to the next project and I can, I can also take, take vacation when I need it. Yeah. I would say that's the pro. It's not that you can make, I I feel like if you, if you work it right and you work really hard, you might be able to make more money than you could in house. Right. Um, but I think the real pro is that you have freedom Yeah. to do, to, schedule your life i i would actually go as so far as to say that doing freelance has has increased my like happiness well Happiness it has reinvigorated my passion for design because like being in-house you can like i've just seen I've seen so many designers get sort of jaded by in-house design mm. because it is like the day to day and the nine to five and yeah, you can and, get in that grind. And like, I think that I don't know. That's not all designers, and that's not all designers in house because in house can provide you with the opportunity to really like detail out a design. But I think being able to be a freelancer and to and to be able to carve out time to work on my own like interests it's very freeing it is very freeing and it and it just like allows me to to cultivate that enthusiasm for design yeah that um i could see if i were still working a full-time gig and maybe i will in the future who knows but um, working a full-time gig, I could see myself just kind of like checking out as soon as I walk out of the office. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I, yeah, I don't know. I I think maybe I do want to just end this in the fact that freelance is still hard. I know we, I feel like you and I have been... We're romanticizing it right now. Yeah, we, we're romanticizing it and we've also been you know pretty lucky to make these connections and have a steady steady stream but it's definitely not easy no definitely not easy i met a like i said i've worked the hardest i've worked since school like it's i feel like i'm back in school again in terms of work level so you know i i just want to make sure that we equal out the playing field here of of the freelance lifestyle yeah and i don't mean to to cut into your final summation no what's your final you have a final summation i i did meet i did meet a freelancer at one of the gigs that i was working at and he was telling me like oh man i'm just so happy to like be working somewhere because for a year i was having trouble finding another job yeah i think you and i are both both lucky but also we've worked really hard to make these connections and also build up build up a a community on Instagram and it like you guys need to remember like I posted every day on Instagram for a whole year that was so hard to to work a nine eight eight or nine hour job then come home and work another three hours on my Instagram that was a 12 hour day yeah so I, I feel like you and I both worked our way up to this level and it just takes a lot of work to get here um but yeah I don't know they're, yeah, they're, don't expect to be sprinting out of the gate. Right, it takes a lot of takes a lot of building up. I think uh, I think Nick, we have. Uh, do we have time for one question? For one more question? Yeah, maybe. Should we pick an easy question? Let's. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that was a, a a really really good topic. I think this anonymous question might be pretty easy. Okay, let's do uh, that. One. Uh, anonymous asks. Yeah, we we had someone. They're not. Their name is anonymous. But no. Um, but they ask, I'm currently in design school. I never took art classes in high school, and now I'm trying to make up for my lack of sketching experience. Any advice for better line work, perspective, lighting, any stories uh, about you guys uh, struggling in design school? Okay, so so this person didn't do much art in high school, 
or when they're younger, but now they're in design school. I don't know if I could, I mean, me, I, I personally did a ton of art in like elementary and high school. Right. I don't know about you, James. Yeah. Did you do? I had, I did the art major in high school. Okay. Uh, oh, but, no. <laughs> but I was, I was a total. So it didn't, it didn't help you. When I, you I did not, I was not a good student. Okay. In but yeah. I the one thing I will say is like perspective, line work, lighting. If you know, if you understand how things like you understand the basics of these sketching tools, it just takes practice. Like don't get discouraged because you just have to work on it for a whole year or two. Right. Like you never like when you learn perspective, you're not just gonna learn perspective and then start drawing 100 percent perspective drawings like right it just takes time and practice yeah that's my best that's my best advice i know that's not the advice that everyone wants to hear but it's just practice you know yeah it's interesting because i actually found that my experience with drawing and with art classes like had been almost a like almost a detriment to my ability to take up design sketching because I came into it thinking like I understood perspective and I understood like how to like how to draw and right. how to communicate and it's just it's a totally it's a very different form of drawing which is completely about communication for sure and um I mean even though I had taken art classes and everything I like I took every sketching exercise that we were given very seriously. And like, I, I think I told this story before, but we had to fill out, we had to do 500 pages of sketching exercises for our first semester of design sketching, which was just like parallel lines. And I would come in every night and do 10 pages. Like yeah. a lot of people were at the end of the semester <laughs> trying to like do 500 in one night. And James, you're the smart one. And I was, you know, I was just like, I'm going to do this. Like I like I felt very fortunate to have found the major that I'd always been looking for and so I was I was enthusiastic to just get into it. And I think like like any, you know, just just it's a daily practice. It's a muscle that you have to develop. It's like it's like running a marathon. Yeah, it's just like working out or I, I agree. It's like, you're not gonna, like, if you wanted to get muscle, like if you want to get buff, yeah, right? You're not gonna go learn how to get buff and then say, hey, I'm buff now. Or, <laughs> or hey, why aren't I buff? I learned how to get buff. Right. You got to just do it. Like you got to work on it. Yeah. And once you, once you start to make gains, you, you don't, you don't just like. You gains just, with, gains with a Z. Yeah. Once you start to get swole, you don't just like. You don't just swell on your own. You have to keep going. Right. You have to keep. Right. You have to keep. Uh, keep at it. And so, I think it's just a daily exercise. Like if it's something that you are really passionate about developing for yourself, like this is a routine that you need to put, like build into your daily life. And I've talked about it a lot, but I'm a big advocate for continuous line sketching, especially because I think it's about observation and um i think it's a good way because continuous line sketching is sloppy in its in like in its essence and i think that one thing that holds back a lot of design students is they are so afraid of putting down the wrong line oh that's kind of interesting i i will say one thing about that is that in order to go in order to be sloppy but good i think you have to be good first you know how you know how picasso's paintings look like a bunch of like strokes and random cubes and you're thinking to yourself well i could do that this is just a, <laughs> like this is like a three-year-old can do this right well I, what a lot of people don't know is that picasso was actually an amazing painter before this mm -hmm. he could paint really realistic faces and portraits and landscapes and all these things and at a certain point he's like well why do I have to paint these realistic? Why can't I expand my horizons and communicate the same information, maybe even, you know, an improved emotional 
information. But I think what you don't get from that history is the struggle he went through to get to mastery. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like there's, there is beginner sloppiness up until mastery and right. then there's the like beyond mastery is the point where you can start breaking the rules right and where you can do sloppy again like, the right way exactly so uh like i just i think that the blank sheet of paper can be so intimidating for be for beginner design sketchers and i remember joe ballet the guy who taught reed and i and our class the form families he did a sketch demo where the first thing he did was to scribble onto the page. And he said, like, the page is not, like, don't treat it like it's pure, basically. <laughs> just I like, love that. I love you that. Know. So I, I would say, like, just just jump into it. Start rough and refine. Yeah. Well, thanks for sending that in. That was a good question. Mm-hmm. If you have questions yourself, feel free. Email minordetailspodcast at gmail.com. Um, of course, every week we like to shout out someone who is doing cool things in design and this week we want to shout out fed rios oh man and that is at fed rios design and uh he i i met fed Rio. did you meet fed rios at square one yeah he helped with my vr demo which was awesome thanks thanks for that fed yeah how did he help out oh well, he was just helping out shaman um but he um i don't know when he came on the scene but he just has the most like lively but tight like there, his sketching style there's a good style that you got fed i mean this this uh these sketches are they're just like an energy to them and i can't pinpoint why or how but you know maybe it's just the pen weight the line weight i don't know line weight's really nice if you guys want some like good industrial design sketching with some good energy, check out Fed Rios Design. Cause yeah, I just, I mean, I'm a sucker for good line work, and and this is some really beautiful line work. James and I are just scrolling through right now. It's just yeah, so, it's, <laughs> oh, so good. And he actually, you know, his second post um, for anonymous is Fed Rios doing sketching warm ups. And he just he just goes through and does all this line work before he ever starts sketching. And, you know, it's like anything else. It's, you know, any sport you might do. It's like the 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 jog beforehand or yeah. any sort of warm up. Um, it's great to see a designer of this caliber still going through these warm up exercises. And it's just an indication of like, this is kind of the seriousness that you need to approach design with. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate that about Fedrios. Like he's an incredible designer, but he's still, he's still engaged in the everyday practice of like, of the diligently, you know, uh, honing, the, honing yeah, the skills, diligently honing those skills. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely check him out. It's at Fedrios Design, and that's F E D R I O S Design um, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for listening, guys. Of course, our intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. What's up? <laughs> and uh, got to subscribe to the YouTube. Got to subscribe to the iTunes or the Apple Podcast. I guess iTunes is dead now, isn't it? Is Google, it? Google Play. <laughs> I guess iTunes is still. I really want to know our music? Google Play numbers. All I know is that iTunes is a thing that you that always pops up and then it's like, hey, we need to update. But what are our Google Play numbers? Well, I, like, for all we know, we have crazy numbers on Google Play. Maybe I don't. I've never checked those numbers. <sighs> Nick, I need it. We. I've been. I was telling James. I think we should do a uh, Google forum. Get some like qualitative data. Yeah. On you guys listening to this, we'll we'll figure it out. I don't know. Um, rate, like, subscribe, all those, all those good things. <laughs> you wrote all that jazz, and you've <laughs> never said it. All that jazz. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm at Nick P. Baker, and I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Peace out, guys. Later. <laughs>